Ever since I was a kid, I've always wanted an FDR X7. I mean, the damn thing looks like out of this world. It's just a really good looking car. Some people are even saying now that it's one of the best looking cars of the modern era. I'd have to agree with that, but every time I told my dad I wanted an RX-7 FD, he'd always say, why would you want that? It has a Wankel engine. Wankel is close to Wanker, and Wanker is no good. So as a kid, I always thought the Wankel engine was just a term to say that it's got a bad engine. It's got a Wankel in it. Like, you know, that doesn't sound cool. And I believed that for a couple years. After that, I figured out was actually the last name of the inventor of the rotary. Uh, that kind of changed my perspective on a lot of things. Now, was he too far off? Is the engine in the RX-7 the best? Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it also has its quirks too. And for that reason, a lot of people kind of stay away from them. They're kind of scared of rotaries. But you guys that are watching this video obviously are not scared of anything because you're willing to take on this challenge and want to buy an RX-7. So in this video, we're going to be going over the years, the trims, the common problems these cars have, a couple of rare parts that you might find on your car you're looking at because there's a 50-50 chance you're probably going to be getting one imported and those always got the goodies on them. And last but not least, we'll go over the rarest colors you could get on FDR X7 to stand out a little bit more. So the FDR X7, believe it or not, actually had a pretty long run from 1992 to 2002 worldwide. But for some reason in the US, it was only sold from 1993 to 1995. For whatever reason, in 1995, people were just not buying this car. What else were they buying, you might ask? Well, instead of buying an FDR X7, my dad decided to go buy a Dodge South Twin Turbo, which is pretty much a Mitsubishi 3000 GT VR4. And I guess that was the case for a lot of other people because the sales were so low, Mazda just said, forget it, we're pulling the plug. But while they lasted, here are the trims you could get. All RX-7 FDs came with the same 13B REW twin turbo engine that made 255 horsepower at 6,500 RPMs and at 217 pound-feet of torque. And I know this really doesn't hold the same amount of weight as if it was a piston engine, but all of that came out of a 1.3 liter engine. And the red line was 8,000 RPMs. I really wish they would bring this thing back. I've never driven in one before, but man, do those stats sound good, even holding up to modern standards. So for the bottom of the barrel trim, you've got the base, and this came with a limited slip differential and cloth interior. Now the dealerships were pretty lax on all of the options you could get, so you could get a base with leather interior if you paid more, as well as you could get one with a spoiler. I guess if you had the money, they were willing to take it because their sales were so low. For the next trim up, you've got the Touring Edition. This came with cruise control. It came standard with leather seats, along with a large sunroof, fog lights, a rear wiper, and the Bose Wave stereo system. Now if you look at this thing, it's like no other stereo system I've ever seen in a car before. It looks like the air intake was routed all the way to the trunk and uh, just a bunch of ugly plastic tubing everywhere. I can't believe they didn't hide this, but I guess they were proud of this back in the day because it's all wavy and crap. So say goodbye to your storage space that you barely even had to begin with. So for 1994 and 1995, you could get the PEP or the PEG trim. This standard for a popular equipment package, and this pretty much was like the touring without all that extra junk in the car. So they took out the rear window wiper. I think I only have one car with a rear window wiper, and for the six years I've owned the damn thing, I don't think I've ever used it. Another thing that they got rid of in this trim was that Bose Wave stereo system, and then after taking all that junk out they added a rear wing and you could possibly get fog lights on it now to talk about the trim that everybody wants the r1 or the r2 although one's got a one and one's got a two they're pretty much the same car except that the r2 springs are slightly softer than the r1 but it's not that big of a deal this came with a cruise control delete a sunroof upgraded springs bilstein shocks strut bar under the hood and additional oil cooling because they know you're going to be going fast in this thing you also got suede seats this time and a front lip spoiler that matched the rear wing in the back of the car. Only 2,600 of these were made in the US and only 57 were made in 1995. For outside of the US, you had the Type S, which was pretty much the base model. <laughs> I mean, think Honda Type S is pretty up there, but in Mazda, it's the base, so don't let it fool you. You also have the Type R, which was similar to the R1 or the R2, and then the Type X, which was similar to the Touring. And for the 1992 model, you also had 300 units that had the Type RZ badge. These shedded the rear seats if you had some to begin with, and they added some nice Showa shocks, Ricardo seats, and all that reduced around 66 pounds. And then in 1993, they sold another 150 of them. So if you have one, yeah, you're pretty special. Don't let it get to your head. Now that we got the trims out of the way let's hop into the common problems yeah this is a rotary so there's gonna be quite a few people always say if you take care of these cars they can be as reliable as a piston engine 
but if you have to do all this stuff to take care of it, is it really that reliable? Well, it could be reliable, but it's not as reliable as a piston engine at the end of the day. And one of those things you have to do to make sure this thing is reliable is perform a compression test. With a regular piston engine, you don't really have to do this. It would be preferred if you do it when you go check out a car, but it's not needed. With a rotary engine, even if it sounds good, if it drives good, make sure to do a compression test on it because it could tell you how long that 13B is gonna last. Now you can't just use any old compression test you got laying in the back of your garage. This has to be a special rotary one that you can get from a couple of rotary stores. It is, you know, more than $100, so you're gonna have to, you know, fork that money over, but it will be well worth it. It will save you a lot of money and trouble down the road if it helps you find an RX-7 with a good engine. Because everybody knows, engine rebuilds are not cheap. A good compression is gonna be 100 PSI, and you want a maximum variance between the chambers of 21 PSI. Anything lower than 85, and you're gonna be needing a rebuild soon, so if the car is cheap, that's the reason why. Now, back in the day, these cars were advanced, and the twin turbo system was really cool, but usually as things age, advanced systems turn into problems just like the Hikus system on the Z32. And this is no different. This turbo system has 67 vacuum tubes that all go bad because of age or heat or whatever it may be. And if the RX-7 FD you're looking at has turbo issues, this could be it. Uh, unfortunately, there's 67 of them, like I said, so have fun replacing all of those. Another common problem is that fifth gear synchros, you know, they're just known to go bad. So just keep that in mind if it is grinding. The number one problem that's not an actual part on an FD is heat. So you just wanna make sure that the RX-7 you're looking at has never been overheated or has a good cooling mod to make sure it doesn't get there. If that's the case, that's a good indication that this guy really cares about his RX-7 because he's trying to keep it alive. Now, if you're smelling gas in the car, pull over, it's not worth the car catching on fire during the test drive and uh, risking your life in the process. Most likely this is because of the fuel dampener going bad and they're kind of known to go bad at like 60,000 miles. Some people delete them, but if you do delete it or if the previous owner has deleted it, the idle won't be as smooth. So it's up to you if you would rather chance having it go bad again in the next 60,000 miles or if you'd rather have a not so smooth idle. Another common issue is that the fuel pressure regulator goes bad and if it does go bad, the car you're looking at just won't start. And I know there's a lot of problems, but we got two more to go through, so don't lose me yet. One of them is that the oil pressure center unit can go bad and give you a false reading. So if you're driving along and that oil pressure center just dumps, uh, I mean, it could actually dump, but most likely it's just a sensor going bad, so you don't have to fret too much about it. And the last issue is that the OMP also likes to go bad. There's a ton of things on this car that likes to go bad, but this is a pretty important one. The OMP stands for oil metering pump, and this is Mazda's remedy to the oil issue. One of the main things that people say about these cars is the apex seals, right? You wanna keep those in good condition. Well, the apex seals need oil to keep them lubricated, and that's what this does. It just pretty much takes the oil and injects it into the intake to lubricate the seals. Now, a lot of people like to delete this, and you might ask why. Obviously it's because it fails. And instead what they do is they put the premix in their gas tank when they're filling up. I would rather go with the second option. And I think a lot of people do just because it's tried and true. If you put it in the gas tank, you'll be fine. If the OMP fails and you don't know about it, you won't be fine. Now on an uplifting topic, let's go over some rare parts that you might find in the car you're looking at. They'll probably bring a big old smile to your face because everybody loves rare parts. If you find some carbon Kevlar Recaros that look like these on the screen, you are in a treat. I mean, carbon fiber regardless, if it's old or new, it's pretty expensive, but these ones actually came stock in the car, so they're pretty rare. You've also got the Mazda Speed wheels, the MS01s. I don't really like these much, but I love the Mazda MS02s, which are probably one of the coolest wheels I've ever seen in my life. I really wish I had a pair of these and I'd stick them on literally anything. And the last wheels that are super rare are the RE, I don't know how to pronounce that, but the Ami Meow wheels. They kind of look gaudy. I wouldn't really rock them. I'm sticking with those MSO2s. Another pretty rare thing is the RZ padded armrest. It's pretty crazy that an armrest is rare, but hey, it is a sports car. Another pretty rare thing is anything that's Mazda Speed. It could be the cluster, it could be the handbrake, or even the Mazda Speed carbon air filter. I mean, all these things are super cool, and it's like finding a Nisma part on a Nissan. And the parts that I listed are a few of many that you could find on the car you're looking at, but if I were to list all of them, I'd be here all day. RX-7s have a lot of rare parts, and it's really cool because it almost makes everyone unique. Now let's hop into the rare colors you could get on the FD. Now, I couldn't find five that were actually rarer than the rest, so I don't want to just name some colors. Here's three that are actually rare and might add value to the car you're looking at. So the third rarest color is yellow Mika. 
Now this color, I hate to say it, but it's just a yellow, but any color on an FD just looks so gorgeous. So yeah, I mean, it's a gorgeous yellow FD. What more can you want? I really do think with this car, they just didn't even have to put crazy colors on it just because it looks so damn good. The second rarest color you can get on an FD is called Chasty White. Only 5% of FDs were equipped with this color. And again, I gotta say it's just a normal white. I don't really see any sparkle. There's no pearlescent. It's just white. <laughs> but just like I said earlier, it still looks super good. Throw some polished wheels on here and this car, ah man, it just looks so good. I honestly think this is an overdone combo, which is the white with the polished wheels. But I mean, it's overdone for a reason. And the rarest color you could get on an FD RX-7 is pearly white. And I gotta say, if I'm looking at a chastity white and a pearly white RX-7, I'm probably not gonna know the difference. So if you wanna brag to your friends and you have a chastity white RX-7, you could possibly say you have a pearly one and they might not know. They might think you're cooler than you actually are. But with it being this rare, you're probably gonna have to pay a higher price tag and I just don't think it's worth it for just a normal white. If you like the white one, I'd go with a chastity white or a more common white or even just with the yellow because yellow is actually an uncommon cool color. So hope you guys did enjoy this buyer's guide on RX-7 FD. If you have any more suggestions on Buyer's Guide or any other content that I can make down below, leave it there. Join the Discord. We play video games and talk about cars. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace out.